But really, the reason POP inhibitors are exciting, it's a, a little bit a new concept where we can use the defect of the cancer to really find a way to, to find a treatment that, that selectively only target the cancer cells. It doesn't work quite as onco targeting the oncogenes. So when you target oncogenes, you target the growth signals. So when you target, we use PARP inhibitors, you target the defect of the cancer, take away the other leg that the cancer is standing on, and by a concept that we call synthetic lethality, can kill off only the cancer cells and not the normal tissue. So virtually the side effects from these new drugs are very limited. And that is, I think, the excitement that you can get a clear clinical response without having a lot of side effects. What have you been doing? You've been developing a lot of these and setting up the, uh, the preclinical models. Yes, so, so we have uh, seen this in the preclinical models right. and it was very exciting at that time. I think it has taken a huge leap into the clinic and now there are more than 50 clinical trials ongoing and, and the results are, have, have not failed to deliver. So we are very pleased, but I think we need to also take uh, PARP inhibitors to a new context. We need to increase the use because these very few patients that are now tested, where well, it's now tested. Patients with mutations of BRC1 and BRC2. Exactly, those patients are very, a very small number and, and other patients need to get benefit from these inhibitors. And, and I think even at this meeting we have come to a, uh, some new insights to, to how we can use these PARP inhibitors to a broader population. Such as? Such as uh, Rob Bristow tell, told us about that PARP is activated in, and, or required for survival in hypoxic conditions. And so you can use these to improve the hypoxia. Uh, you can also, uh, and I will not tell what Anthony, <laughs> Anthony is here so he can tell himself, but I think that there are also other ways, and I'm, I mentioned that we can see an increased PARP activity as a marker for recombination defects, and we can use this. To, to identify new cancers with these type of defects, which we can, which we can go after. My uh, first uh, interest in PARP inhibitors was when I was heading up cancer research campaign and we developed temozolomide. Mm -hmm. It took us 10 years to think about putting temozolomide together with the radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was an extraordinary piece of translational mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. which we all know about in glioma. And we also know the basis of it at a molecular level, which is great. Um, it's taken us a shorter time, thankfully, to think about PARP1 in association with something which is rather good at creating mm. DNA mm. breaks, although not uniquely single-strand breaks where PARP is involved. Anthony, tell us what the excitement is in the radiation world. Well, with radiation, you've got the opportunity to focus your, the main component of the treatment on the tumour, because yeah. you can direct your, your beams. Uh, so it's different from chemotherapy in that sense. Um, we can cure quite a lot of tumours with radiotherapy, but there are many tumours which we can either have a partial benefit or, or not much benefit. Uh, and the reason for that is we can't give a high enough dose mm. to cure the tumour, because if we give a, um, a bigger dose, we'll start damaging the normal tissues. And if that happens, it's permanent and it's, and it's devastating. So where PARP inhibitors are exciting are that we can increase the ability of the radiotherapy to kill the tumour cells but in certain situations, it looks like we won't increase the e effect on the normal tissues. How come? The reason for that, well, there's lots of different potential reasons. The, the clearest one is that PARP inhibitors will only increase sensitivity to radiotherapy in cells that are actively divided. Exactly. And then we know that most tumours are very rapidly proliferating. Now, some healthy tissues are also rapidly proliferating, and so we need to be careful about those. But some normal tissues barely divide at all, and you can think of the brain as being classic for that, and also the spinal cord. Mm. And these are two organs that, you know, as radiation oncologists, we're very wary of giving too much dose to, because if you exceed a certain dose, you cause very severe problems. So for the first time, really, we've got a new treatment which will specifically increase the radiosensitivity just of the dividing cells. Um, and the other thing that's so exciting about PARP inhibitors is we can give them as drugs which circulate around the body and they have virtually no side effects mm -hmm. whatsoever. And the patient can take them for quite a long period of time if they need to. 
Do you agree about that? I agree with it. And I also I want to add what Anthony is saying is that we also see a, a vascular effect by PARP inhibitors. Okay. So we can see an increased blood, throw, blood, uh, blood flow through the tumour. And for, for radiotherapy to work, we need oxygen. Mm. This is well established. And hypoxia, which is also severe in glioma, is, is something important to tackle. So the increased vasculature with PARP inhibitors can also increase the potential use of PARP inhibitors. And I think that might underlay, underlie one of the uh, sort of, we have seen a little better response in the clinic or in the, in, in the clinical models than mm. we have in, in, on cells, which is very encouraging mm. and which also can, could potentially be explained by this, these other effects beneficial effects by so, so how are you going to choose which uh, clinical studies to carry out and what translational science are you building mm. into them okay we saw today in the session you know that a lot of work is going on now is to really understand which cells will particularly be susceptible to the combination of radiotherapy and mm. PARP inhibitors and how we can identify them so if they are defective in other DNA repair pathways. How did you tell that? Well, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. You can do sophisticated assays on cells in the laboratory, which might take days, weeks, or even months to carry out, and that can give you your answer. Mm -hmm. The challenge in the clinic is having a simple test that you can do rapidly on a biopsy or a specimen mm -hmm. in time to get the answer so mm -hmm. that you can start the treatment. That's an old problem. Mm -hmm. And there's the one, is there a candidate? There are, that he's happy with. there are many candidates. Mm. So Thomas's work recently has identified, interestingly, PARP activity itself in tumour cells As a seems to be an indicator mm. that you'll get some response to PARP inhibitors on their own. Mm. Mm. When it comes to the combination of PARP inhibitors and radiation, we know that the tumour has to have lots of proliferating cells. Mm. Mm. But beyond that, we don't know. And what we need to do as clinician scientists, with the help mm. of... Thomas and people who are running labs, is when we do these studies to get tissue from the patients and do the appropriate assays mm -hmm. properly, high quality, mm -hmm. so that we get from these early trials some answers as to which patients are likely to benefit. Mm. There, so there are also, and I, can, uh, and I can extend to this, assays where we, from biopsies, can directly assess repair capacities and, and yeah. there are several studies published by, for instance, Nicola Curtin and Simon Powell, showing that you can assess the repair capacity in the tumour and that then can... Uh, Us using what? Then they can use RAD51 foci formation, which is a... RAD51 is a protein involved in homologous recombination mm -hmm. yeah. and it is formed after radiotherapy. And, and those, uh, that, those cancers that do not form RAD51 foci as effectively, mm -hmm. those are defective, have a, have a defect in repair, and that those will benefit further from a part one inhibitor. Okay. inhibitor. And, and that's something which can be done reasonably quickly. As that can instead. be very quickly done. So that shouldn't hold things up yes. too much. Mm. But you still need to get, <laughs> you still need to be organized and be, mm. have a surgeon who's motivated yeah. to take part so that when they do the operation or the biopsy, they give it mm. appropriately, rapidly, mm. the nursing staff are there to deal with it. The scientists are and waiting you, for it. It needs to be very pathologists well as well, yeah. of course. But these are, know these are logistic uh, yeah. issues, which if you try to explain to a patient and say, well, it's very difficult to do this, they would not understand, would they? Potentially, but I think it's also <laughs> an important point for the, um, for the funding bodies, for example. You know, when we do these studies, unless there's the infrastructure to do the associated mm -hmm. assays, mm -hmm. those studies are going to be not a waste of time, but they're going to be... We're not going to make the most of them. No, I agree. Yeah. Any imaging uh, technology coming along the line which might help you detect which patients, yes, which uh, patients now? There are some. Can you image DNA repair, Thomas? Uh, you start to. There, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are possibilities to start to visualize DNA repair in, in tissues, yeah. in, in real tissues. Yeah. Uh, these are still very much on an experimental stage. Sure. And it, I think it will take a few years before we can use them in any clinical setting. I, I'm a l almost a little doubtful. I'm hopeful, yeah. but doubtful Definitely. that, that okay. it will actually be feasible to do in the clinic. Well, you can image hypoxia. Yes. Mm. Which is part of the equation. Yep. Um, and, and the study that we're 
um, planning with Cancer Research UK, which is due to start in March, will have an imaging component. So they'll have functional MRI pre and post the PARP mm -hmm. inhibitor, okay. looking in, in brain tumours. And it's, a co it's an exploratory But it's pre and, really. pre and post the radiation that you want to... Well, yeah. when you irradiate tissue, yeah. you get so many changes in so many mm -hmm. um, variables that I think it might be quite difficult mm -hmm. to see what difference the PARP inhibitor has made to all those changes. Oh, so to, as a starting point, we're going to image pre and post mm -hmm. the PARP inhibitor before we add in the radiotherapy or the chemotherapy. Good. Yeah. Where will we be in two years' time, Astro? Two years' time. That's I think there will have been the first uh, phase one studies of radiation plus PARP inhibitor. Good. We already have... Which um, tumour? Um, glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. um, brain metastases, I think, mm -hmm. would be a That's useful a idea. area. Yes. Um, mm. There are people that are investigating lots of tumour sites, esophageal cancer, rectal cancer, head and neck cancer, mm. any site that's treated primarily or where radiotherapy has an important role and where we don't cure everybody, there's a potential. Mm. But in each of those sites, there are normal tissues mm. to consider carefully. Mm. Timozolomide, PARP inhibitor and radiation in the glioma? I think it's got MGMT, enormous, yeah. enormous possibilities. Mm. I'm still embarrassed by not having yeah. spotted tevazolamide as a radio sensitizer. Well, yes. it's interesting that you say that we understand the mechanisms. I, I don't think we do, actually. Okay. <laughs> I still th we don't really know whether temozolamide is a true radio sensitizer or whether you get additive benefits from temozolamide and radiotherapy. In a way, it doesn't matter because it works, right. but only for about 25% of patients. You mentioned MGMT. A lot of brain tumors express MGMT, which makes them resistant to temozolamide. If you add the PARP inhibitor, that should overcome temozolomide resistance mm. in at okay. least a percentage of patients. Mm. And maybe there'll be an additive or synergistic effect mm. with the yeah. radiation. But always with c combinations of chemotherapy and PARP inhibitor, we have to worry about mm. systemic Excess toxicity. Radiation. And radiation toxicity. Yes. Oh, uh, exacerbating yeah. the radiation yeah. toxicity. Yeah. But, it, but we already know that uh, in many cases, if you add the PARP inhibitor to temozolomide or other drugs like docarbazine, mm you get more bone marrow toxicity. Yeah. Okay. Mm. That would be yeah. a problem. Uh, Thomas, last word. Two years' time from your work, what do you expect to be presenting in Astro? Uh, so two years' time, uh, well, uh, I will hopefully be presenting new ways of doing radiotherapy, radiotherapy combinations, mm. which goes beyond PARP inhibitors. Mm. Uh, what's really on the agenda now is recombination inhibitors. We, we have some data suggesting that recombination is progressively activated during the course of radiotherapy. And, and, that we, and that this might be a re reason for radio resistance. We want to follow this up and come up with inhibitors to see how we can combine those. Okay. Um, yeah, for PARP inhibitors, I think two years from now, the phase three will be ready. Okay. So we will have PARP inhibitors on the market, which will make them more accessible and more accessible also to clinical trials. So I think it will be an exciting future. Yeah, I think so too. Thomas and Anthony, thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks.